Okay. If I could have everyone's attention, we're going to get started. So if you could please find a seat, we'll uh, get this little program going. The mic is actually on. My colleagues always worry when there's a microphone in front of me. Um, good, good morning, everyone. My name is Jay Dworkin. I'm a senior physicist at Fonar Corporation, Health Management Corporation of America, HMCA. Uh, we'd like to thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today. Uh, we think we have a very fruitful educational program set up here for you. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. First, uh, we know that focusing on a lot of technical talks and information is hard work. So I want to assure you that there's going to be plenty of sustenance. There are two coffee breaks scheduled with some snacks. Uh, the Millennium folks have arranged a very nice buffet lunch in a private dining room on the second floor, which you can reach either through the elevators or just kind of walking down the steps. Uh, the other thing to mention is that uh, this, these proceedings are being recorded and videotaped by uh, some very talented professionals from a company called PSAV, which is a global leader in the audiovisual services industry. Uh, so please, the standard canonical announcement, please silence and or turn off your cell phones. Uh, we would really appreciate that. And uh, finally, to keep things going, I'm going to be uh, making sure that the trains run on time today. If there are other questions that you may have, please let me know if there's something we can do to help you in terms of your visit here today. Uh, but I would like to introduce the first speaker. Now, it's always challenging when you have to introduce a speaker that really needs no introduction. Uh, our first speaker is the inventor of the MRI machine. He's an accomplished business leader. And I have seen up close and personal his relentless commitment and passion as a physician to helping patients all around the world. He is the founder, president, and chairman of Fonar Corporation. And we're very pleased that uh, he uh, will have a chance to make some opening remarks. Dr. Raymond Demadian. Thank you, uh, one thing I thought when I got up here and was preparing for the talk, Jay pointed out to me there was a little clock here that had the exact number of minutes I was allowed to talk staring me right in the face. And it said 40 minutes. That's says 41 and, and, now. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So, <laughs> and he said, I'm tracking it over where I'm sitting. He said, but I'm going to be a little more generous. I'm going to give you a little more time. So about five minutes later, I looked at the clock, and it said 41 minutes. <laughs> I haven't started it, though. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <clears throat> The way this meeting came about, and, and you know, this, I want to make sure that everybody understands that this meeting is not about promoting Fonar and the Fonar Upright MRI machine. And the way I can prove that to you is that we've been in business for 38 years and we have never had such a meeting. And the origin of the meeting is that with the Upright MRI, um, as we began to use it, we started running into ever-increasing massive numbers of patients that have this syndrome. And the distinguishing characteristic of, this, of these patients is that they would go to the doctor. Now, now of course, we were seeing the, the pathology that these patients have on the images. And we saw all kinds of deteriorated, degenerated structural problems in the cervical spine. But they would be going to their physician who would uh, diagnose them as ear, nose, and throat, and send them to ENT and give an antibiotic. And they went on with this syndrome completely uh, uh, compromised uh, and, and nobody making the diagnosis. And I became aware that the medical profession was very much unaware of this syndrome. 
So what we decided to do is let's have a meeting and let's begin the increasing awareness of particularly the medical MD profession because the chiropractic profession understands this and has a lot of experience in it. But I was very concerned because a lot of the patients who have this problem go first to their practicing physician, their primary care physician, who then sends them for ENT and antibiotic. So I, I, when I realized the scale of this, I said, we've, we've really got to do something about it. Now, there are 1.2 million whiplash injuries occurring every year. And that are, are not statistics that I'm making up. Those are the statistics directly from the National Institutes of Health. And I'll be talking more about that. So I wanted, to, I wanted everybody to be here so we could begin the process of notifying uh, the medical profession, physicians in particular, of the existence of this syndrome so these patients can be uh, 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 appropriately uh, addressed. <clears throat> now, one of the things that we decided to do was give it a name. And because of the, comp the, 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 the symptom complex, uh, we ended up choosing the name cranial cervical syndrome. And what happens in a lot of these patients is that the symptom onset uh, appears as, for the most part, cranial symptoms, um, dementia, loss of cognitive power, um, and a variety of other functional symptoms where the medical profession is apt to construe appropriately, because it makes sense, that it is primary in the skull and in the brain. And when the patients come to us, they've had a brain MRI, but the symptoms are originating in the neck, as you'll see as, as we talk about this. So uh, we, 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 found, we felt the need to address that. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, um, the National Institutes of Health, these are their statistics, 1.2 million whiplash injuries per year in the United States per 315 million people straight off the U.S. Census Bureau and IH. So it's, it's really on a massive scale every year. So let me begin the story then with this lady. This is, this is Christy Fisher. And this is really how we first became aware of this. And what happened is that my wife and her relatives, uh, my wife came to visit her relatives in Elkhart, Indiana. And we went there, and on a Sunday, we went into a church, a very large church, and there was seating about 1,500 people. And a woman walks in that looks like this. Her name is Christy Fisher, and, my, and she's very conspicuous because in the midst of 1,500 people, when somebody walks in and sits near you looking at that, it gets your attention. Then my wife turns to me and she says, I spoke to my cousin, and she says, uh, she, saw, she said, see that lady, um, she's having drop attacks. Now, I don't know how many people in the room know what a drop attack is, because I've asked uh, professionals over the time and asked them if they knew what a drop attack is, so I want to make sure everybody knows what that is. What a drop attack is you're standing talking to the patient, and the next thing the patient's on the ground unconscious. A minute and a half and the patient wakes up. But the problem with these drop attacks, it can occur while you're driving, it can, uh, it can occur you know, on, a, on a limitless number of circumstances. So my wife turns to me and says, uh, that lady over there, Christy, is having drop attacks. So I said, well, has she ever had an automobile accident? And she says, not that I know of. So, Right after the uh, church service, I went to Christy, and I said, have you ever had an automobile accident? Because I had made the connection in my own head that there was usually associated, these drop attacks associated with trauma. And she said, uh, did I ever have an automobile accident? So I said, well, you, you know, Christy, you've got to come and be scanned, and we'll look and see if we can uh, find out what the pathology is so that we can address the need. <clears throat> Now, she said, I wear this helmet because I have these drop attacks, and I can't control them every two days. The longest I can go is three days. And so I have to wear that helmet to prevent me from getting uh, fractures or concussions. 
So um, we brought her for a scan, and this is what we saw. Uh, we saw right from the outset she had tonsil ectopia. The tonsils were down. Chiari syndrome, as it's called. Uh, you see it here on a sagittal. You see it there on a coronal. And here you see it on the coronal again. Uh, you can see these tonsils are pretty, are very pronounced as they're falling down. So I had been uh, working with Dr. Rosa, in, uh, who is one of our, our key speakers today, and we took uh, Christy up to Dr. Rosa, and Dr. Rosa treated her. And in association with this, which I, um, we saw a malrotation of C1 and C2, small but a malrotation. And uh, Dr. Rosa, who you'll be hearing from, is a specialist, a chiropractic specialist in the cranial cervical junction. So he readjusted that. And immediately, uh, Christy had relief. Um, <clears throat> and the other, the other thing I want to call to your attention, which is a, a central part of all of this, is that's a lot of CSF up there that's pooling in, in Christie's image. And we've given it the name cortical CSF pooling. And of course what it is, it's an indication that there's an increase in intracranial pressure and that's why it's pooling. So Dr. Rosa treated her <clears throat> and um, what I, here's some of the other things that were going on. Uh, we saw when we did the uh, axial cuts, uh, these flare axial cuts, we saw this periventricular edema uh, on all of Christie's images, and we saw CSF leakages coming out of the horns of the lateral ventricle. So that was an indication to us that she was indeed having increased intracranial pressure. And this naturally draw our attention to the anatomy of the cervical spine. And one of the things I want to call attention to, this is the, this is the cranial cervical junction right here, uh, C1 and C2 in, in conjunction with the uh, uh, occipital skull. But the other thing to take notice is that the cervical spine is seven elements, seven vertebral elements, but in particular what's quite conspicuous is these two arteries that are in, in, in fact entrapped. They're in, entrapped in the transverse foramina. They're in a hole in the bone. And if those bones move, they're going to pinch those vertebral arteries. So the, another thought was that maybe these uh, attacks that Christy Fisher were having was due to uh, malrotations of C1 and C2 that were pinching the arteries. And then when I spoke to her, she said, Dr. Mania, I can't go more than two or three days without a drop attack. Um, <clears throat> Now, just a little bit about the anatomy. This is a side view. There's our vertebral artery. Uh, we have these uh, uh, ligaments that are supporting it. There's the vertebral arteries making their turn. Uh, this is the, you see the ligamentum flavum here. And another key element in this, and this is a critical part is cranial junction anatomy, uh, is, is this articulation between the C2 and the dens and C1. And there's a, there's a group of key ligaments here, which Dr. Rosso will be talking more about, uh, namely the ALAW ligaments that uh, join C2 to the skull, which are these angular li ligaments this way, and also this transverse ligament, uh, which helps stabilize that critical uh, mobilization of, the, of C1 inside of C2. <clears throat> now, there's, uh, there's another piece of technology that I want everybody here to know exists. And also, Dr. Rosa is going to be stressing that don't just go use this technology, because if you don't do it right, you can hurt the patient. Uh, but the technology that Dr. Rosa has used uh, very effectively in our patients is the AO instrument. And the patient lays on this bed on their side, as shown here. Uh, the treating uh, physician will take into his hand this device that's got a stem coming out of it. It's a hollow stem about three and a half inches long. It's got a plunger, and he'll put that plunger right behind the earlobe where the transverse process of C1 is located. And he'll tap it and put that back into rotation, and you'll, you, you, the, the patient will miraculously have the symptoms go away. It's, it's really astonishing when you see it happen, because it's, it's, it's almost impossible to believe. 
Well, as of today, now, Christy Fisher had been having, was, was having drop attacks every two to three days for four years. As of today, Christy Fisher's last drop attack was 148 days ago. So I thought maybe you'd like to meet Christy Fisher. Chrissy? Um, can, we, can we have the lights for a minute? Come on up, Christy, and tell us your story. Good morning. As Dr. Gamanian said, my journey started about six years ago. I was having drop attacks in the beginning about every five to six days, migraines, vertigo, dizzy spells, <clears throat> and panic attacks. I had seen all the top doctors at all the top institutes in the United States with all of them saying the same thing. There's nothing. Oh, let, me, let, me, let me interrupt. I want you to know that before Christy came to us, she had gone to um, the Mayo Clinic. She had gone to the uh, University of Ten Tennessee, the mm -hmm. University of Indiana, and who else am I leaving out? Um, University of Chicago. OK. And the diagnosis was, at best, dementia. Right. And so she was, she was just completely lost and distraught uh, and uh, until we ended up meeting them. Go ahead. They stated nothing was wrong, that it was all mental. They would hand me a bottle of pills and tell me to come back in three months. The symptoms kept getting worse and worse. The drop attacks had increased to every couple days, if not daily. The migraines were unbearable. The panic attacks were so bad I would end up in the ER. The dizzy spells and vertigo were so bad that I'd have to crawl if somebody wasn't there to help me get where I needed to go. I would spend days and weeks in bed at a time, not being able to get up and raise my head because of the vertigo being so bad. I continued to try to find new doctors at new institutions, but ended up with the same results. They'd hand me a bottle of pills and send me on my way. It got to the point where I was taking over 650 pills a month. A lot of the pills given to me to help counteract the side effects from the first medication I was given. So after three years, I could no longer stand the despair and the pain and the torment I was going through. I had decided life was no longer worth, worth living. I flew to Florida to stay with my brother under the guise that I was going to attend a pain management center in Orlando. I made it about two weeks at the center. Again, more medication, more injections, and an urging to continue to seek more counseling. I sat on the bed with a handful of pills and decided enough was enough. I couldn't do it. My brother came home early from work, found me, got me the medical treatment I needed. And as I was recovering, I asked him, I said, Chad, how, how was it you came home to, you know, two to three hours earlier, never home before noon? He said, I had a pit in my stomach that urged me to come home. You needed help. There was something wrong. So as time went on, I continued to ask him what he thought. He said that the same day that he came home early, there was an urging to him that it would be okay, God had a plan, and I had a bigger purpose. Little did I know how big that purpose would be and how much God was in control. Six weeks later, after I returned home, I met Dr. Domanian at my church in Elkhart. He inquired why I was wearing a helmet, so I explained to him, you know, my symptoms. I had had repeated head trauma, five or six concussions, and I had to wear it to protect my head. He began to draw an illustration, explain to me what he thought I had wrong with me, and I kind of chuckled. I said, yeah, if I had a nickel for every time I heard what was wrong with me in the last four years, my husband could retire. But somewhere deep inside, I was cautiously optimistic that maybe truly this gentleman would have the answers to my problems. I spent the next few months having MRIs, spinal fluid flow test studies done, and it did confirm his, his suspicions. I had low-lying tonsils. He referred me to his colleague, Dr. Rosa, who thought that he might be able to help me with my problem. And help me, they did. It's been 149 days since my last drop attack. My headaches are gone. My panic attack, my vertigo, vertigo and dizziness, non-existent.
I'm on less than 45 pills a month, most of which are supplements. I'm able to do things alone again. My family doesn't have to be with me 24 seven. And there's not enough thanks to God for bringing them into my life and for them to be able to do the research needed to help me. I do feel believe that my sense of purpose is sharing my story. If I can help get the word out to help just one person give them just a ray of hope, something I didn't have for four years, then my journey was well worth it. Thank you for your time. Now, I can tell you in the many countless numbers of patients that we have, this is a common story, although Christie's is by far the most dramatic. But the, the, the patients that we are meeting with these here on, unretractable pressure headaches and drop attacks are just numerous and they're universal. And my guess is, by the way, that there isn't anybody in this room who doesn't know somebody that has been inflicted with a syndrome similar to this. And that's the reason for the meeting is the massive uh, pandemic uh, con con uh, context of this. And we just need everybody to know. Now, <clears throat> as I said, we have given it the name, the cranio-cervical syndrome, because the symptoms are both cranial and cervical. And so we wanted you to um, know that. And one of the things that um, you have in, um, each of you has this in your folder and I'd like to call your attention to it because there's something in there that I want you to know about that's very important. And, and it's the definition of this syndrome so that when you as physicians are meeting these patients, you will recognize the syndrome and also recognize that there's something on the treatment side you can indeed do something about as opposed to diagnosing it as ear, nose, and throat for antibiotics. And I want to call your attention to some of the symptoms. The most dramatic of the symptoms is something the patient will describe as a pressure headache. And this pressure headache is often incapacitating. It's very severe. And when you meet some of these patients, um, which I have done, they'll walk into your office like this. And they'll describe to you knife-stabbing, pin-sticking pain. And it's very common if you, if you ask him if for detail, that is, it is located at the back of the neck, often at the base of the occiput. And it, it's important to be able to recognize that because the next thing that has to happen is that they have to have an image evaluation of their cervical spine. And then the rest will, will uh, more or less take care of itself. Uh, the headaches are very often accompanied by tinnitus, blurred vision, tunnel vision, double vision, nystagmus is common kaleidoscopic vision. And then finally, these pressure headaches, if they've been long-standing, uh, will be uh, accompanied by uh, dementia and the loss of cognitive skills, and the physician will have diagnosed them as dementia. And we've had some of these disastrous uh, circumstances. Now, additional and associated symptoms are, as I mentioned, drop attacks, loss of balance, numbness in the legs, difficulty walking is a common symptom, and you have, I, 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 we went through the trouble of laying out all these signs and symptoms so each of you could have a personal copy uh, as you're uh, meeting these uh, patients and then have some understanding of when you should uh, judge the symptomatology to be the cranial cervical syndrome. Loss of motor skills in the, in the lower extremities, sudden dropping of things from hands, loss of color vision, numbness in the legs, Numbness and loss of motor skills in the upper extremities. Vertigo, vertigo is a common symptom, especially on standing and walking, um, and numbness in the legs and the feet. Now, the radiological findings, when we look at them, and, and, and th by the way, this, this is really coming to focus because of the existence of the upright MRI. I mean, we, we would have known nothing about it except that we're doing cervical spines as a function of the upright MRI, and, and all of a sudden this thing uh, uh, unfolds. And what we see when we look at the radiological findings is we see 
uh, significant degenerations and malalignments up and down the cervical spine. Uh, we'll see retrolisthesis, we'll see anterolisthesis, somewhere between C1 and C7. We'll see man, malrotations at the craniocervical junction, we'll be showing you pictures of that today. Uh, we'll see uh, significant disc herniations, usually impending on the cord. Uh, a common finding is what you just saw with Christy Fisher, which is uh, cerebellar tonsil ectopia, otherwise called uh, Chiari. And then the last thing that we see, and now, now that, and, and, and I need to make some comments on that. A lot of what has shed light is the sudden availability of this unique technology called cerebrospinal fluid imaging. So you, we're going to show you, but we have this new technology, it's not more than 10 years old, where we're able to see movies of the cerebrospinal fluid coming in and out of the skull. And we have with us uh, as a, a guest the uh, original discoverer of that, Dr. Bill Bradley. You'll be hearing from him. And uh, what was happening with Bill is he was looking at cross-sectional axial images that uh, included at one spot the aqueduct of Sylvius. And while he's looking at the aqueduct of Sylvius, over time he says, wait, wait a minute, the intensity of the fluid inside that aqueduct of Sylvius is changing with time. And in fact, he went and put, then connected to the cardiac cycle, and he saw that this cerebrospinal fluid was changing in direct synchrony with the cardiac cycle. He said, it must be moving. Now, when I went to medical school, there was no such thing as cerebrospinal fluid moving. The, my chief resident would say to me, Demetri, uh, get me, a, get me a, a lumbar spine, please, a tap. And so I'd go to the patient, and I'd put a needle in the spine, and this thing would drip out. As far as anybody knew, it was a static fluid. But what has really opened the doorway is this phenomenal discovery that this fluid is a dynamic physiological fluid and it's critical to uh, maintaining the physiology of the skull and the brain and that includes all the neurodegenerative diseases you encounter every day, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, all the things that you'll be hearing about and especially and the most dramatic, drastic of all, childhood autism. And that these are not being diagnosed and that's what we need to change because the consequences uh, for these poor souls are basically disastrous. 